Greetings friends, Stephen Easterbrook here, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 11. And we're looking at, uh, we're looking at God's discipline, lessons in endurance. And I'm going to start reading from Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not have a much more, have we much more been subject to the Father of spirits and live, of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for, for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplined us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful, rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here is the reading for today. So we ask the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ and to be in Christ? To be a child of God. And that's what we're really looking at today. I certainly never thought of looking back here to a specific um, date and saying, you know, when you look back and you say, well, it's certainly not this. You go back and I say, I became a Christian on this date, and that's that. That's not really biblical. Uh, you can go through the whole of Scripture and see where that happens. It doesn't really work that way. So that's not found in Scripture. What you find is this. What you find is this, that having believed, you go on believing. There is an element of endurance. But how does that endurance work? And that's, that's what we're looking at. Having trusted the evidence... You moved on beyond the evidence of knowledge and faithfully trusted in the one who has been revealed to you. And you understand and have an endurance in faithfulness to Christ. And that's, that's how it works in verse 1 here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, notice that word, witnesses, let us also put aside every weight. So in such a way that sin doesn't get in the way because Christ has dealt with your sin. Persecution also comes, but as believers you are not ashamed of Christ who, have, who you have put your trust in, who you've seen the witnesses of, and whom you have trusted relationally. So we run the race and we do not stop running the race. But where is our faith? Is it in our running? No, it's not in our running of the race, but in the one who has bled and died for you and done all the work. The challenge here is to believers, not to unbelievers. As I've said, know the gospel, but have not gone all the way to the end to full faith. They know the truth. They know the evidence, but they haven't committed to the Savior. Because salvation is not just for saying, I believed once, but that's the last step I took. Salvation is for full faith. 
for full faith, full believing in Christ, having faith in Christ, beginning to end. We are called to run the whole race. That's the important thing. Christ did it all, right? But if you ignore him halfway, it's not going to work. And you do your own thing, how is that going to help you? If you run half the race and you ignore him for the rest and run off into the bleachers, that's not going to do you any good in the race of life. Being a believer is not a passive state. It's an active one. Even though the work has been done by Christ, the endurance is whether you stand still or you go backward. And that's forfeiting God's work. So we participate in his great work, or not at all. Okay, so it's his work, not our work. We participate in his work. Heaven's reward is in Christ, or not at all. He is either your king, or he's not your king. You submit to him, or you don't submit to him. That's how it works. Now, a race is not an easy thing. You know, you get tired when you run a race. It's hard. It wears us out. There are obstacles that we are to endure. The race we have to endure if we are to win. But what holds us back? How are we to win the race? Well, what are we supposed to do? Are we trying to outdo each other in righteousness? No, because that will not work. That cannot work out for us, because none are righteous, not even one, as Romans says it. Only Christ is righteous, and what he did he did not pursue comfort, he did not pursue wealth, he did not pursue health, he did not pursue great wealth or great learning or popularity, none of those things. He pursued God's will. He made himself a slave, a servant to all, a ransom for all. To purchase all people to God. Who would follow, who would trust him and believe on his name. We are not competing against each other as believers to win this race. That's not how it works. It's not a race of doing works. But as Hebrews has shown us, it's a race of faith, as we saw all those people who believed on Christ even before Christ had arrived. That great promise. It is a race against Satan and the world system that exists. It is a race against our own sinfulness that wars against us in Christ. And in this race, our strength is not our strength, if you are a believer. Because we couldn't do it on our own strength. It is the strength of Jesus who endured the cross and the mockery, the shame. And he overcame and is now seated in glory. If you read these first three verses, they're powerful. They're, they're amazing verses. And we are called to endure in him, not in our own. We are called to endure the only way possible in him. We only fail when we stop trusting in him because we can't do it on our own. Satan has no power over you in Christ because you died in Christ and you are raised in Christ. So when the devil looks for you, he can't find you because you're dead already and you are alive in Christ. In God's spirit, you run successfully. You have to lay off the old encumbering, old weights of the old tradition. That's what he's writing to the Hebrews. They want to go back to the old ways, and that's hindering them. And you could think new traditions, new ways, your own thoughts about what God is supposed to be. But the word tells us, look to Christ, not tradition. He also speaks about sin 
And now to be clear, he speaks of sin holding you back. Unbelief. Just be clear that sin is not things that you think are sin, but actual sin that you don't want to give up. But it is Christ. He's the perfecter of our faith, the author and perfecter. From the beginning, he authored our salvation from way back at the beginning. And his cry, it is finished, on the cross declares to us that nothing better is coming because there is no greater salvation, more perfect than him. He was hated on our behalf. And that we can say with Paul there, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. He who suffered, verse 4, what Christ suffered. Who suffered what Christ suffered? No one. An amazing point is being made here. Jesus is the Son of God who died, who rose, that we could be called sons of the Most High with him. Adopted sons. Yet we have unfolding these Hebrews potentially facing persecution and thinking of bending the knee and going back to their old traditions because it's easier than being persecuted for Jesus. They had not experienced the suffering like Jesus had to death on the cross. They had um, not shed their blood for the faith. They had not suffered for the gospel. None had given their life for the gospel. None were sinless like Jesus. Same as us. None were perfectly obedient to the Father. Now some of their number, some of their suffering that they may have had, may have been deserved for crimes or for spiritual discipline. That may be the case, and that may be the case even today for some people. And that's the key word here that we're looking at. Um, for the next little section. Discipline. The Christian life uh, involves enduring, working, being faithful, struggle, and relationship, and discipline. And that all falls under that faith category. Faithfulness. These are not for unbelievers, though. But believers in relationship with God. And we have to really dig into this because that's where discipline comes from. Discipline stems from correcting sin, but it isn't judgmental or accusatory as um, the way Satan uses it. It's different. And you can tell how it's different because the way God uses it. Satan uses it as judgmental or accusatory, but God uses it as disciplinary and loving. It is punishment, but not like unbelievers receive punishment. God punished David when he sinned with Bathsheba and killed Uriah and disciplined him through Nathan. So what happened? Well, ultimately through the judgment and through the discipline, David became a better person because of God's intervention and judgment. That's how it works. When a parent disciplines a child, they don't do it to ruin the child's life. They do it to correct the, the error, and they become better by it. The devil seeks to ruin and destroy. God does it to build up. It's hard to see, though. It doesn't feel good when we're disciplined. But we have a good father, and he does no evil. We must also, uh, in verse 5, allow God's discipline to work in us. Because if we don't, we allow Satan the victory in us. We must trust God. We must listen to him. We must allow God the victory and not Satan. He loves those whom he disciplines. And it should also encourage you when he disciplines us, to know that we are his children when we trust in Christ and he disciplines us. 
more than any earthly father could do because, you know, he wants the best for you. So much more than your earthly father or earthly parents do. And they are, they are earthly, but God is heavenly. He is eternal. And he wants the best for you to be righteous and mature. Righteous and mature, obedient, full of the Holy Spirit. Kingdom people being rooted in his love. That's amazing. God was afflicted in every way that we might share in his glory, in his holiness. Christ suffered every shame and sin on the cross for our sake, that we might know the very righteousness and love of God. There is indeed such great assurance here. Such great and great assurance when we face this, these correctives. And it shouldn't cause you despair. God corrects the children he loves. It isn't pleasant, and the writer admits that verse 9, but it produces life, holiness, a spirit of peace, fruit in that respect. The best way to lose a child is to tell them everything that they do is fine and good. What kind of child is going to grow up? A child that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong and doing the right thing. Lie to them. Have your own way is the best way to say that you don't love them. So we respect our earthly parents to protect our children, to parent correctly. How much better... God, who is the perfect parent. A Christian who rejects God's discipline over and over can lose their eternal life because you'll be going the wrong way. You'll be rejecting Jesus. And that's very serious. And this really helps in having a better life today when we obey God. So yes, this is a battle today. A battle of our very hearts and lives. Though yes, Christ has won the battle if we would but trust him and endure. And we will have eternity. We must endure in our surrender to our author and perfecter of our faith, the Lord Jesus. Psalm 119 verse 165 says that those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to fall. What an encouraging word. Verse 10. Highlight what living for God is about. Well, it's about being different. It's about holiness, God's holiness. Because He is holy. He doesn't discipline you out of anger. He doesn't discipline you out of spite he doesn't discipline you by mistake uh, for the wrong time or the right time or some reason it's always for the right reasons it's always at the right time he always does it for your good that we might share in his eternal holiness and his holiness is that separation from sin he of which we're actually ultimately going to fully understand um, when that, that day that Jesus returns and we see the pain is taken away, sin is done and dealt with, evil is destroyed, and death is destroyed too. But in part we're seeing this starting in our lives when God disciplines us. I'm going to close here today. Yes, discipline is hard, even when it comes from God, probably more especially so. But like many correctives, when you are ill, you get medicines and they're not always pleasant. Working out at the gym, it's going to hurt when you burn. Studying for an exam. Researching. It's not easy, but the outcome will bear the fruit of your, of your labors. And hopefully that'll be good stuff. Now through God, it should be better. Because through his discipline, his correcting. His correcting some sin in your life. 
will lead to something greater. So it's not just a, I hope it will. It definitely will do, as we've read in the scripture. It will lead you to greater righteousness. It will lead you to stronger faith. It will lead you to stronger faith, hope, better patience, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians that you can read, to a better, more spirit, sorry, to a better, more spiritful life with God and his people. And you know that when the trouble in your life comes, you'll be able to stand stronger with Christ and in Christ. You will endure even better with Christ. So welcome his discipline as a child of God, because many unbelievers don't know what that's like. When they feel discipline coming, it's usually a threat. and They don't know how to receive it because they're not in Christ and they don't know a loving, um, correct, corrective. But as a child of God, he leads us. He's not there to destroy you. He's here to lift you up. And as we do so, we look and keep our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to leave that with you guys today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are good. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died for us and took our sin and shame upon, her, upon himself. And we thank you also that you love us, that when we trust in the Lord Jesus, you have brought us into your family as your children. And though sometimes you discipline us, help us to see that it is out of love and that you are building us up into your kingdom and that we would, that we would be made stronger for you and in you and that in that strength we would rest in Christ. We pray this. In his name, our Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you, friends, and I'll see you again very soon.